So today we're going to talk everything paid ads with Steve, who is our CMO. I think it would be good because you're like the grey man at FBU who refuses <laughs> to fucking the do shadow. any content <laughs> and never puts his face in anything Ever. to uh, give people a bit of an explanation of who you are, where you come from, what you do. Age, sex, location. <laughs> yeah, ASL. I used to think people call me an arsehole online when I did that. That when, was the abbreviation. When, I was, when I was a kid, they'd send ASL, and I was. I used to be on AOL chat room. Obviously. And it was the like, only place to be. ASL, a- <laughs> ASL, and I'd be like, why is he calling me an arsehole? <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely, I said to my dad, everyone's calling me an arsehole. <laughs> like, like 12 in this chat room. <laughs> so then I just played on Magic Carpet instead. Like it. Good times. Um, yes, my name is Stephen Craven. I am... Um, CMO here at FBU, been back in the business for about a year now, um, having consulted for, I don't know, three or four years before. It was a while, yeah. Um, my background is very much paid media, so I have ran and still continue to run a small agency, which is focused on performance marketing, paid ads, copy, email, that type of thing. Um I also am co-founder of Stridist, which is one of the um, client management softwares in the fitness industry. And really my background has been for the last 15 years, I am old, super old. Uh, The last 15 years has been digital marketing uh, in SMEs, small and medium enterprise businesses from like one man bands up to kind of what we class as more of the M in in the SME space. So medium sized, Technology businesses, education businesses, that type of stuff. Um, and yeah, we have been back in the FBU fold for a year, a year of change, a big, big, big year in terms of growth and things that have happened over that last 12 months. But I think we're in a good spot, we've got a good team. Um, work a lot on obviously on our internal stuff, which is important, but then also do a lot of the consulting work and hands of pump work for agency and CEO clients, which is kind of the, probably the big bulk of our time. Um, so, yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. You I got lost in the story then. It's a great story. I got lost in the story. <laughs> um, I think it would probably be best to focus on the the higher level CEO and agency clients of this because we don't tend to talk about them a lot. No. Um, it's something that is probably one of our major focuses going into the next 12 months yep. is really kind of heavily putting resources and and attention into that area and paid media is going to obviously be a massive part of that yeah what's your what's your thoughts on like the role of paid media within a fitness business because i think it's it gets tarred with a really bad brush doesn't it like it does and i don't think maybe it's it's very a a current thing i think maybe back in the day when online coaching started i'm assuming because i probably wasn't around then that it was very, because I hear a lot of the taglines like, this is how to grow your business without paid ads. And I always yeah, think, yeah. I never really thought of that in the first place. Like it wasn't a really pain of mine that I was like, oh my God, oh, yes, I want to build it without paid ads. But yeah. it seems to be a consistent theme that I see across people's marketing of, yeah. I'm going to teach you to do it without ads. And and I think it would be good to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I think there's been two big Black Swan events Um in the last probably 10 years, which have given us that frame of thought or given a lot of the industry that that frame of thought. The most recent one was COVID. So what happened in COVID was, well, two things happened in COVID. Obviously, businesses were locked down. COVID happened, pretty obvious. But what that did was everyone was on furlough, or the vast majority of employee people were on furlough. And the... Digital marketing space, especially for SMEs, has no barrier to entry. It's very similar to the fitness mm. industry where you don't actually need a qualification to do anything in the fitness yeah. industry. Digital marketing for SMEs is exactly the same. There's no formal governing body that over, oversees them. There's no accreditation that is needed in order to say, I am a marketer, marketing expert, whatever. Um, so it's a very, very low barrier to entry. And what happens at any point of recession, low barrier to entry, um, biz op opportunities suddenly see a massive spike. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously at this point for COVID, digital marketing was a big one because bricks and mortar businesses were closed. That meant they had to go online or they died. Yeah. So it's that old adage of in the gold rush, selling the spade is better than being the gold panner, panning for gold, right? 
So that's what people did. They went, oh, I'll be a marketing expert. I'll help these other businesses who are desperate to market. And what that caused was a huge influx of really shit quality marketing agencies that sprang up in especially that first 18 months, which caused a massive issue for any business owner like mm. who was trying to, you know, who were desperate at that point and needed help. They were just getting sold shit by knobheads, like in, in all honesty. Uh, and then iOS 14 happened. So iOS 14 was oh, I remember that. 2021. That was me. Yeah. We set up, that was that was when we first started working together, wasn't it? We set yeah. up that whole campaign. Yeah. Did, came in, did all the filming. Yeah. So, it, yeah, I'll let you finish this. Yeah, so iOS 14 was a major update from Apple where they basically, so historically, meta ads, without getting too technical, meta ads would use um, cookies as their ability to track traffic around the internet. So if you installed the Metapixel on your site and the Daily Mail had it installed on their site and Keelan had it installed on his site and I had it installed on my site and Neve went from every single one of those sites, Meta would know that that's where she'd been. She, they'd know what content she'd engaged with, what ads she clicked on, what have you. And then they would pass that back to Meta to improve their targeting. So it'd say, all right, Neve's been on a photographer's website, she's been on FBU's site, she's been on my site, she's been on the Daily Mail. Cool, let's build up a profile of what she likes and doesn't like to make targeting easier and more accurate. And in iOS 14, Apple decided that they were, as a blanket rule, not going to pass back cookie information to third-party advertisers. This is a very generalist explanation of what happened. So suddenly overnight, that tracking degradated like daily. So that tracking would be updated in real time. So you'd, you've seen it before when you go onto Curry's and you'd look at a particular Hoover and then you go back onto Meta or onto Instagram or onto Facebook and that Hoover would pop up on every single thing that you looked at for the next few days. The quality of that data degraded over time. And that led to a really, really difficult, um, probably six to 12 months for advertisers where they couldn't retarget effectively. The targeting options that were in Meta weren't great. And Meta then scrabbled in to, uh, to deploy en masse their API integration um, and their server-side tracking, which is a lot more complicated than setting up a pixel, which meant that, in effect, like owner-managed, owner-operated businesses who were used to being able to run an, a, an ad on, on Meta and, and get some sort of result just couldn't because the yeah. tracking was out, the targeting was out, they didn't have enough data to, like other businesses like our business, we use our data really well and we don't, rely on detail targeting we rely on our first party data our own engagement and our own um, pixel uh, visits and and what have you if they didn't have that they couldn't target so that made a massive massive issue that created a massive issue um so those are the two probably most recent big black swan events for small businesses who wanted to run their own paid ads um and then all these knobheads cropped up overnight offering services that they probably didn't know how to do they'd had success running ads for themselves but decided that then now they could sell running ads to other mm -hmm. people and it just creates this bit of a shit show where there's a real apathy towards marketeers like running ads like oh, I've, I've used agencies they're all shit i can't get ads to work for me facebook ads are shit it's not that it's probably just the way that you've been doing them is shit and that that's the they're the two big bits that have, have really had a, a lasting impact on this space um and then as you said what that creates then is people who try and sell you something else to, mm. to, to counterbalance it. But for me and for any business that I've ever been involved in, whether it be as a consultant, whether it be as CMO, whether it be as like the ads guy or a marketing consultant in uh, for our own businesses, like paid is the starting point for a lot of those businesses. Yeah. Like we'll try and get somewhere organically. So we create a bit of budget because I bootstrap everything. I've never took investment apart from uh, in the last 12 months, but we bootstrapped every other business we've ever ran. So we'll do make some money organically, but then it'd be like, how can we grow and scale with paid? Because ultimately having a predictable uh, number of inbound leads every day, week, month or year is really the only way to grow a business. Anything else becomes kind of a bit of hit and hope. Yes, you can create systems and processes for content, for organic, for email, but unless there's new blood coming in through a predictable means, it's kind of a little bit hit and hope. That's my opinion anyway. Well, that's the thing we we found that quite a lot with. So, <clears throat> when I first came into coaching, everything was organic. It was very much like, yeah, you've started here, like do these posts, get these results, blah blah blah. 
which is fine. Yeah. But the problem with organic is you're kind of playing with what you've got. Yeah. In a sense. So like with me, when I started my coaching business, I was quite fortunate for the point where I'd started making content years prior. Mm -hmm. So I'd had three, four, five years of doing that. And at the same time, I still had a new traffic acquisition like center because again, there's you've always got in a business, I think, to find a way to get new eyes onto your product. Now you can do that by being really, really clever or being really funny, like on social media. The way I did it was there was this software called Auto Insta, which is basically like an algorithm based thing. And what you did is you logged into it, you, you paid like nine ninety nine or whatever it was, and then you put like 10 or 15, I think, other Instagram accounts of like where your target market would be. So I did like all high-end bars and restaurants and then other high-end gyms like in Manchester. And it would follow and comment on their posts mm -hmm. to get them to follow you back. And then if it, if they didn't follow you back within 48 hours, it would then go and unfollow them for you. And like that was, that was working for like six months. Mm -hmm. So I did that to grow my following from... I think it was around 2,000 to like over 10,000 in a period of months, just centralized around Manchester. Yeah. Which was annoying because then every time I went out, everyone fucking knew who I was. <laughs> and they're like, you're that PT, you can't be drinking that. And I'm like, but I at least had a traffic source. Yeah, yeah. Now, obviously then Instagram clocked onto that and then they banned it and then they mm. got really funny about third party softwares being plugged in. Yeah. So then really what never happened, I think, is like a shift back towards ads where people were like, no. I need a bigger audience. And when I think about like fitness businesses, you can't just hope that one day you randomly get an audience big enough to sell your product to. No. And you also can't just look at the 500 followers you've got and gone, cool, who are all these people? Let me try and make something to sell them. Cause they're going to be probably your mates and your mum's friends and all that stuff. Yeah. So like if somebody's new coming in, what are the kind of options that they've got low budget to try and kind of grow that following like new follower ads for us are like the still like the cornerstone of what our paid ad strategies uh, are around like we uh, we've got clients in agency and even just in fully booked who are spending 50 quid a day 20 quid a day 10 quid a day and getting 20 30 40 50 100 new followers every single day of a target demographic into the business. And I think that's the key point. I actually did a presentation to some of the clients, uh, sorry, some of the other businesses that are incubator at Stridist um, invested in, did that in January or February this year and sat down with those guys and kind of went through like, what should a software business, like something completely left field from what we normally talk about, what should a software business be doing on social? And it was the same thing. It's like, just grow an audience, grow interested parties in your particular niche. Yes, you might have an architectural drawing software, but people want it. It's like a, a useful tool and there'll be people who are interested in those types of software. So spending five to 50 quid a day on generating really good quality new followers through the right type of content and a, a piece of content which is designed to generate new followers. I think a lot of times, and we see we still see this in our program, like, especially the guys who first come in, it's like, well, what worked well organically last week? I'll put some budget behind that and that will get me new followers. And it might, but creating pieces of content specifically for growing an audience mm -hmm. and putting budget behind it, I think is still, A, the easiest, as in like the easiest to run from through Ads Manager. It's like five button clicks and it's done. Um, Even I can do it. Yeah. And I'm awful at it. <laughs> yeah. I'm banned from our ad account. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's like the easiest the most straightforward. It's the easiest like growth metric for you to understand as well. It's like how many followers do I get that day? Yeah, okay. the tracking of it's quite it's simple. Tracking yeah. super easy, super straightforward. And then the long tail like benefit of it and like the different sales opportunities that come from it. You know, if you've got time to be in your own inbox or if you've got someone managing your inbox for you, being able to reach out to those people, start conversations, make offers to them. Like a hundred new people to make offers to every day is like, the easiest way to scale a business, right? And if it's costing us 50, 60, 100 quid, it's pretty much a no brainer. Like I'll speak to people in like businesses that are completely left field outside of the coaching space and say, just do that, do that for three months, see what happens. I probably will guarantee you'll get more sales from it. 
So I think in this sector, in our sector, in the health and wellness space, when there's so many people in pain, we see the news all the time of like so many people who are struggling, so so much like bad news about our space, to be able to put really good content out that attracts people to help them solve their problems and then communicate with them on how you can, which is a no-brainer. Why do you think like coaching ads or like running ads is like so underrepresented in like the online coaching space? None of the mentors know how to do it or well, do it well. Yeah, it's like the, the hook and crook of it. Like the people that are in the space trying to educate have never done them effectively. have never run them for their own coaching business effectively. have never spent good money on ads before. Or have an agency potentially. Or have an agency partner who does it for them. And therefore they still don't have the expertise to do it. And then they can't teach it. Or if they teach it, they teach it wrong. And then they get found out for teaching it wrong and then they stop doing it. That is really the, the be all and end all is they don't know how to do it effectively. A lot of the times it'll be tactic led. So it'll be run this many chat automation ad. Yeah. It's very tactical as opposed to like overarching theory. This is how ads factor this in is as how part marketing of your wider works. business model. This yeah. is why how this is why someone responds. You know, we're very fortunate to work with Mike, uh, Samuels, who's worked with us for a long time and is, you know, great guy, um, who helps us to put together like a persuasive argument and a persuasive slant on all of our copy so that it moves someone from a you know a, a passive viewer into an engaged an engaged lead or an engaged inquiry, in, engaged prospect, and copy is a big part of that. I think, again, not to shit on Mike and the the stuff that he sells, but I think copy is seen as a dark art as well. Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, there's a very simple formulaic approach to it, which you know, if I can write copy, you can write copy, then it's not massively difficult. I'm sure there's more extra extremities to it and more detail to it, but on a basic level for writing copy for ads. It's not hugely difficult once yeah. you've got a formula. That you can use. Especially for something like fitness, where it's not as if you're you're selling anything particularly left field, are you? Like no. it's not it's not hard to write a piece of copy that convinces somebody that losing weight is the right thing to do, or that they're going to be happier by doing it. Exactly. Whereas there is some copy that like takes people from not knowing what something is, convincing yeah. them it's going to solve all the life's problems, and then into them purchasing it in you know five hundred words or so. Yeah, exactly. So I think those are the the key air, like why it's seen as such a dark art, why it's not taught that heavily, why it's seen as something to be to be fearful of is because they don't know. They yeah. don't understand how to do it. They don't not, got, haven't got any expertise. They've outsourced it to a third party for their business. I always feel like there's the danger of like the the double dip problem as well in it. That like if you've got somebody like, it's it's a double argument, I find. Like when we sign people up, we've got the first argument with them, which is why you should spend your money on, coaching with us, mm-hmm. which is one hurdle to get over. Because yeah. if people want to make more money, generally they want to probably keep hold of some of the money that they've got. Sure. So you've got that one. Then you've then got to convince them to not only pay for the program, but to then spend more money. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think that requires a lot of trust from the person that's in the coaching program. Yeah. And I think that's why they don't, because if you're not like... I will hand on heart be like, run our ad strategies. Literally, you've got to try really, really hard to fuck it up. Yeah. And if you do fuck it up, you fucked it up on five quid a day for two days and you've lost a tenner and then we'll find out what's wrong and we'll fix it. Yeah. I think when other people are running ads for people, if, you, if you're if you not confident that you can get that process to work 100%, yeah. you've not only charged someone for the information of running the ads in the first place, they've then spent on the ads. And then if they really don't work, you're fucked yeah i mean i i changed fundamentally changed the philosophy of the, my marketing agency for basically that reason it was like we couldn't work with and because I, I did it and we tried it we couldn't work with like entry level new to the industry coaches because they were spending a couple of grand on our fees then i wanted to spend a couple of grand on ads and they just didn't have the size of business and mm. the scale for it to work you know i was like well could they do a better job spending four grand on ad spend than spending two and two with us they could probably ham it out if they tried really hard and followed a really good structure. Mm. That's, so we just stopped doing it. And that's why, obviously, in FBU now, we only take people on of a certain point when they can afford ads and ads make sense for them for agency. And up until that point, we'll coach them on it. We'll tell them how to do it. Yeah. We'll give them all of the resources. We'll do calls with them. Because ultimately, like I always say, this spend is it's a finite number. So if you spend 
a thousand pounds in a day, you'll get the same result if you spend a hundred pounds over 10 days, you just get it in a day as opposed to 10. So getting the numbers, getting the data is the most important bit when it comes to running paid ads. And I'd rather you just spent more to get more data than pay someone 500,000, 1,500 quid unless you're ready for it. Especially when that's going to be the majority of your budget. That's like all spending of the budget. 50, 1,500 quid on the agency and then 500 quid on your ads. Makes no sense. Yeah. Not anymore. Like historically. Yeah, because Meta can sort of figure it out for you in a way. Historically, when we were getting leads at one, two, three, four, five quid, it was still a profitable process. Like you could spend 500 quid, I'd still get you 100 leads. You could still sell 20 of them, 15 of them. If your front end offer was good enough, you'd still make a profit off my fee plus the ad spend. So that was always my goal is like, can we make you profitable off our fee in the ad spend? Now lead costs are rising. You know, there's more We probably could have follower ads, but we'd feel like absolute fucking robbing bastards, wouldn't yeah. you? Yeah. Be like, yeah. right, do you film that piece of content? Cool, I'm going to go press four buttons. That's it. So it's not going to work in the same way that it did five years ago, six years ago, 10 years ago. You know, I looked at my first business manager account. I opened that in 2012. So that's, you know, 12 years of running some sort of paid ads through Meta, whether it just be the little shit right hand column ones before the real ones came mm. along, the new f- news feed ads or what have you. So, you know, in that time, things have changed dramatically. We could get for gyms leads for like 30p. And that was like we could fill a program on 100 quid a week, sell, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 trials in a week for a gym which was a spit and sawdust gym in Warrington, 4,000 square foot. It's not like that now. So I think the gone are the days of spending 1,500 quid on a uh, media buying company and 500 quid on ads to try and make an ROI as a as, as anyone in this space. I just don't think it works. I think there's better processes. There's better funnels that you can run yourself really straightforward that will get you a better result. Where do you see like, where do you see paid ads going? In the so, coaching space, do you see it making a comeback? Like, I know, I say comeback like it's ever gone anywhere. Anyone that's run a, a very highly successful business has always had it as part of the back yeah. pocket. But I don't always think it filters down to... And I think we're we're a microcosm as well, right? Like we, we are talking about the conversations and influence that we get from the other mentors in the space and the people that work with us. So we see, you know, part of a whole picture. Um... I think in the fitness industry as a whole, you know, so many people have lost ad accounts. They've been banned because they put before and afters. They said, lose 10 kilos in 10 weeks and all this sort of stuff. It's just against Mm. terms of service. Like anyone with common sense would be able to go, don't say that. that, That's a bad idea to say that. Put that three landing pages away. Yeah. So like because of all those things, I don't think you will see a massive resurgence in the health and wellness space for paid ads for like coaches. I don't just don't think you will until Meta b- roll out their fully auto autonomous service, which Press is coming. Yeah. Like if you go into Ads Manager now and you put in a piece of copy, Meta will then suggest three versions that have been rewritten by AI it's for you to use. They have the advantage plus audiences now, where you basically plug in some basic details. They do the rest of the targeting for you. It does a lot of the targeting based. It, it scripts the video now as well, doesn't it? It can do. Yeah. So like, there's loads of AI-based, um, autonomous features coming in, which I think in the next, I don't know, 24 months or so, you will see pretty much a, like, tell me what your product is or tell me what you're trying to do. Tell me who your audience is. And then Meta will just do all of the stuff mm. for you and run it. And what will happen is those ads will be like miles cheaper than ones that have been cost because they want you, to use, they want you yeah. to use that. So that will push a lot of the, starting point coaches to that type of offer. But until that point, I just don't see it as, as um, no one else is re- like, there's so many, so few businesses, sorry, that are championing it as a, as a real like performance metric for people to use that I just don't see it like catching fire in the way that it did do until that point where there's something completely automated. I, I really like it. We've shifted a lot of our coaching towards it over mm-hmm. the last six months. And it it is a struggle for certain coaches. If you come yeah. in and you're at absolutely scrap zero and you've got no money, you're struggling to get buyers, like you've not really got an organic audience to get a first set of cash from, it maybe does alienate those people out of the sure. process. However, those are probably also the hardest businesses to get off the ground because you're literally starting from day dot. 
100%. Where I love it is like the case and example of a personal trainer. So a personal trainer is on the gym floor. They're doing four or five sessions a day, 40 quid a session. The old way of doing it or the way that's even still taught now is then you've got to go home. You've got to make this massive piece of content. You've got to do all this fancy editing. You've got to follow all these people. You've got to go onto 10 different pages and comment. And like, yeah. as a personal trainer, like that's not your forte. Like you do not want to be doing that. And that can be a couple of hours of work minimum, yeah. like per piece of content. Whereas with this, it's like, cool, that 40 quid that you did that session for, reinvest that 40 quid back into this process where you make one piece of content one time, maybe once a month and redo it. And that 40 quid that you did that session for will bring you in 120 new followers. Yeah. And out of that 120 new followers, you're probably going to book, what, five calls? You might sell two. Again, I'm spitballing from numbers that we've got here, so don't take this as verbatim, but you can turn 40 quid into a 400 pound program. Yeah. An 800 pound, uh, you know, two sales of a 400 pound program. No problem. And if I said to you, every time you go and train that client, the trickle down effect of that is going to be two 800 pound packages. Yeah. You'd it's like do that client bringing two you? referrals in every time. Yeah. That's, that's if I said to you, you go it. train that client once, they're going to bring two referrals and we'll set up a system to do it. Everyone you you do pay it. a fortune for it. Yeah. And it's just, I think, the conceptual element of it with the business owners. And I think that'll be the thing when that almighty meta thing comes in, it won't be the, how do I do it problem? Mm. It will be, how do I fit it into my overall business plan and make yeah. sure that all the margins matter, which I'm actually quite excited for because it means that people are actually going to be able to run a fucking actual business. Well, that is the other side of the coin is like, when is paid not right for people or when when the businesses struggle with paid, it's those entry points in. Or it's when businesses are tighter on cash flow than they actually realize. You know, I've, so many businesses that we've spoken to over the years have come in and gone, oh yeah, we're doing 10 grand a month, da, 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 but I've got this. We, this we've had thing. people come in over 200 grand a month and have exactly the same issue. Yeah, I've got this thing that I pay for and this thing, and then these people are doing my sales for me and this is going on. I'm like, well, actually, that 250 grand that you're doing actually boils down to 40 grand yeah. in liquidity at the end of a month. And I want you to spend 30 of that on paid because that's what you need to grow to the scale that you want to. Mm not going to work yeah and that there or, or it's there's so much fear around doing it because it keeps the you know it means that the profitability is up in the business that they don't want to do it either so i think that's the other side of the coin is when is paid not right probably when there's other issues in the business that uh that could could impact on the ability to spend confidently you know so many coaches that we work with have, or, or that we've spoken to have that they don't run businesses, they've got a, they've got a job. Yeah. For sure. And that's, that's one thing to always remember. I think for me, like when I look at it, I don't even think you always need to have paid ads running. No. But I think it's something that you have to be aware of, like when you build your business and you have to understand that at some point, if you want to continue to grow, you are going to have to allocate this budget somewhere. Yeah. And like for me, the issue that we've spent a good portion of the year sorting out was the fact that like i grew my business way 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 above and beyond like what i thought capable of and when you get people that come from not making a lot of money at all to then making 250 275 300 grand a month because it feels like fucking fun money or even when you start doing like 10 15 yeah. 20 like i was very fortunate to the point where like i grew organically like way past where normal people would normally be able to yeah and i've had like big business people turn around to me and be like, you fucking managed to do that without running any ads at all. And I was like, yeah, but the gravy train always stops somewhere. Of course. Unless you can just keep getting new attention. Like there's probably other way around it. But like when I wanted to go down the paid route, it was like, okay, cool. Like what do I need to do to like get into paid? And they went, well, usually a business of your size, you would want to allocate like 20% of your revenue towards paid. Yep. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I've spent that <laughs> elsewhere in the business on yeah, this yeah. and on that and on this, you know, member of staff and on that member of staff because I never went forward with it in my head going, at some point in the future, I'm going to need to spend 20% of our revenue on driving new customers. I was just like, cool, this will just happen forever. And I didn't need some of those people. I didn't need that level of infrastructure or staff that I had, but because I had the money there, I was like, well, fuck it, it'll help us to grow. Yeah. That might be one of the hardest workarounds and getting out of that process that I've ever done in business. And that's why I always bang on to like clients, especially agency level. 
don't overpay that person. Don't pay him this. Like paying coaches like four grand a month. I'm like, don't pay him that. And they're like, why? It's fine. Like I've got money. And I'm like, you won't when you get there. One of the big things I've noticed in the last year as well is, and I, you know, as I alluded to before, I'm a little bit older than most of the clients that we work with. This isn't my first rodeo. It's not my first business. For a lot of these people, it is. Mm. It's your first business. You hold on to a lot of the things that you've built, the structures that you've built, sunk cost fallacy a lot of the time. You don't want to break things apart again because you think you've invested the time in the right in the right areas. You know, sacking a member of staff who isn't, you know, isn't really needed at that point, but is a great member of staff and works really hard for you and has been with you for the last four years is really fucking hard. But if it's the difference between growth and staying where you are or profitability and being on a knife edge, those decisions need to be made. And I think that's the other side of it is sometimes we're asked, you know, we have to ask really difficult questions of ourselves in business and go, actually, do I need to break apart this, you know, 15 grand a month business that I've grown from nothing and I've worked really hard on, I've put the last five years of my life, six years of my life into, do I have to break apart a few of these things that I've got built up in order for me to move forward? And that's a really difficult mental block to, to overcome um, for a lot of people, me myself included, um, but sometimes it's for the necessary good. I think that separates the the real business owners though. It does. Because it's easy to take, like people think starting a business is taking a risk or like start, it's easy to take a risk when you're starting from zero. Yeah. Like when you've got nothing really to lose. And I think a lot of good business owners come from having nothing to lose. Yeah. And then you see them all get to a certain point where like they feel like they're successful and asking them to re-risk that again to go with a different strategy that's potentially, you know, a bit left field from what they were doing currently and they're going to have to take a step back to go forward. Yeah, I always find that second risk is the one where people really find out whether scaling is right for them. Yeah. Not whether having a business is right for you because a business is kind of whatever you want from it. But some people come in and they want a nice business where it's like, I want to earn five, 10 grand a month and then have a bit extra and, you know, manage some costs, blah, blah, blah. And some people come in and they're like, I want to fucking go for it. And the ones that want to go for it get to a point where it's like, okay, you're going to have to fucking roll the dice on this again yeah. to get where you want to get to. Yeah. And I think that's part of the the paid media thing is investing that budget into it and taking that leap of building your systems around that model when it's maybe something that you don't particularly understand yeah, naturally. You, you know, if you think about all the times that we get, people say, oh, the you know, paid leads are really hard. Like, yeah, because they're colder than mm -hmm. the people who've been following you for the last year you managed to suddenly just get over the line because you've put out another piece of content. All of that. The shit leads. Yeah, the shit like, leads. Like, no, no, you've just not spent two years nurturing them. Yeah, you know, the, the, there's a completely different set of rules and strategies from closing a warm lead to closing one that's been created through digital marketing, through paid or whatever. And most business courses or mentors, or A, don't know the difference, or B, don't give you the structures and frameworks in order to make the change or the, or the difference. And... And those are really key points. Like you will close less. It will be hard work. You will do five sales calls, six sales calls, 10 sales calls before you make a close. You've got to be comfortable with that. You know, I used to manage a sales team of 30, 35 people doing 300 to 350 cold outbound calls a day. And they would work off like less than 1% close. But we could still make the numbers work and we, we had to turn over 250, 260 grand a month just to keep the lights on we made the numbers work because it was a numbers game and sales and, and sales skill is, especially with digital leads, it's part of that. It's making sure you're doing everything you can pre-call, but then also just working the numbers, being really consistent with your sales skills and with your pitch and then just putting the reps in. If you're doing two calls a week, you're not going to get the exposure or the visibility or the frequency of sales calls in order for that to even work. If you're doing five a day, chances are you're going to get there. Do you think that's a small benefit of paid as well that people don't understand you get a, even if you find it difficult to transition at first, you get a very fast and hard lesson about growing a business 100%. by running it. Like those sales calls that might have taken you six months to get in the diary, you've in now got in, yeah, you've now got in six days. Yeah. And you know, when you're doing back to back, like for fitness, especially because the calls are only half an hour, you're doing 10 calls a day for five days in a row. You learn a you lot. You quickly figure out yeah. the sales process. Yeah. And also, an you, you, yeah, you learn a lot. And I think that's something that if you've got the budget for it, if you're somebody that sat there and you're making an excess two, three thousand pound a month and you're not really doing anything with it and your business hasn't moved for the last couple of months and your tactic is, 
I'm going to try and book more calls in. I'm going to try and close more deals. I'm going to try and move my price point. You're never really going to get, like, we have this argument all the time with coaches when they go, oh, I changed my price point. How many calls have you done? They're like seven. I'm like, come back when you've done 50. Yeah. And then, but then you're thinking, if you're not running some sort of traffic, how long is it going to take you to do 50? Six months. So, like, if you're serious about growing a business, if you're serious about scaling a very methodical way where it's numbers, data-driven, like, this is what goes in, this is what comes out. Yeah. Again, like I said, you've got a couple of grand spare. Things haven't moved very well. This might be something that you need to really take into consideration of maybe going through a little bit of a turbulent patch for six weeks while you figure all this shit out. But when you do, you've got a completely different business on the other side.